everyone. Welcome to our ECG presentation. I originally intended for this to be just a quick little overview, and in, in a lot of ways it is. We're, we're leaving a lot out, but it's, it's tough to do a quick overview of ECG. There's just so much to it, and there's so much that can be... Um, learned from a patient's ECG. So to, I didn't want to cut too many corners. So I apologize if there's a little excess of information here, but trust me when I say I, I did cut a lot out. So uh, ECG stands for electrocardiography. You have probably heard EKG. Uh, this technology was invented in Russia and they spell cardio with a K. So EKG kind of stuck around for a long time, but eventually we uh, got around to changing the acronym and all the textbooks and stuff. So ECG is the appropriate abbreviation to use. And it's a measurement of the total electrical activity of the heart. It's not an action potential. We're not saying, oh, here's depolarization, here's repolarization. Um, we can identify specific waves with specific repolarization or depolar depolarization events, but we're not actually like examining a membrane potential. We're just looking at the sum electrical activity within the heart. And we do that uh, by tracing a line onto ECG paper. And so there's some basic stuff I want you to know about ECG paper. A small box is 0 0.04 seconds wide. So the x-axis is time. A large box, see there's slightly darker lines here, is a 0.2 second. Um, duration. So if you imagine a six second ECG strip, which is a common amount of time to look at because you can multiply the number of QRS complexes by 10 to get a pulse per minute, um, you're going to expect to see 30 of these. Let me see, is that right? So five of these would be one second, five times six, 30. Yep. So you'd expect to see 30 of these on a six second tracing. Uh, we don't use this information as often, but a large box is also a half a millivolt. So if you see a line go up one box, that's a half a millivolt elevation. And there's some diagnostic stuff we use with elevation and depression, um, especially with the ST segment, but we'll, we'll hold on to that. Okay, first, let's just talk about heart rate. So the most common method is the six second method. So this is a 30 box, six second strip. So you count the number of QRS complexes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and multiply by 10. So this person's pulse is 80. Another method, which I really do not like. <laughs> um, so, but, but I'll explain it to you anyway. We actually can't really do it with this strip, unfortunately. But you want to find a strip that has one of these QRS complexes right on a dark line. So I guess this is the closest to being on a dark line. And then you count in either direction uh, how many boxes till the next line. So let's see. One, two, three and a half. Okay. And so every new box you get to, well, let's try to, let's try to match this. So one, two, three, it's still like three and a half. So you decrease in pulse this amount. So if it was one box over, that's, that would mean the pulse was 300. If it's two over, that's 150, three over 100, four over 75. And it's just over four over, which is about 80. So it still works. But if you see like how much longer that took to figure out, um, I don't particularly like that method. If you have these memorized really well, it can be quicker. You know, you just find one right on a line you go oh, three boxes, pulse is 100. So it's technically faster if you're very practiced, but I, this is still the most common method, the six second method. If someone has an arrhythmia, um, you're going to want to do more than six seconds. You're going to want to do like 30 seconds. If there's an irregularity to the beat, meaning some of these QRS complexes are closer together than others, that would render the R wave method completely useless. And it would also make the six second method pretty inaccurate. 
better than the R wave method still, but you want to use a 30 second method. So you would count um, basically five, six second ECG strips. You would count how many QRS complexes there are and multiply by two. And that's for someone with an irregular heartbeat. So what is an irregular heartbeat? What is an arrhythmia? Well, first we need to learn what a normal rhythm is. So a normal rhythm originates in the sinoatrial node. So it's called a normal sinus rhythm. Sinus meaning SA node initiated. Normal meaning the RR interval is regular. So the distance between QRS complexes is uniform. So it's a normal sinus rhythm. Impulse originates in the SA node. QRS complexes are upright, identical, and there is a P wave. Um, bef I'm sorry, P waves are upright, identical, and precede a QRS complex. There's exactly the same number of P waves as QRS complexes. There's no missing things, no missing waves. You have a P wave, a QRS, and a T for each beat. The PR interval is 0.12 to 0.2 seconds, and you would use that by counting boxes to determine. Um, if you remember this, so each little box is 0 .04, 0 0.04. So if there's more than 0.2, in other words, more than five little boxes or one box, that would be in a normal rhythm. It's difficult to see, but it looks like there's only like maybe hmm, one, two, three little boxes. So that's perfectly normal. And here... And same here, very little gap between the P wave and the QRS complex. That is called the PR interval. If, and if you don't remember any of this stuff, definitely uh, you can take another look at the cardiac physiology lecture. Um, but so hopefully, hopefully you still know what all these mean because I, I didn't plan to review all of that stuff again. Uh, and then a normal pulse is, or normal beats per minute is 60 to 100. And so you would count one, two, three, four, five, six, times 10, 60 beats per minute. This is a normal sinus rhythm. Regular RR intervals, there's a P wave, a QRS, and a T in each place, and there's a, a P wave. Uh, the P wave presence indicates that the SA node is pacing the heart. Sinus bradycardia. Everything looks the same in the sense that there are normal configurations of a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave. Um, there's no dropped beats. There's no missing P waves. There's no variance in RR interval. But if we count, 1, 2, 3, 4 times 10 is 40. 40 beats per minute is below 60. So it's no longer normal. It's still a sinus rhythm, but it's bradycardic. Uh, so we would say that this patient has sinus bradycardia. Sinus meaning there's still P waves. It's still paced by the SA node, but it is paced very slowly. Um, sinus bradycardia is not necessarily a bad thing. It could just mean that someone is highly trained. If they were bradycardic because the P waves were gone, well, that would be a big problem. That would mean the SA node is damaged, and now maybe the AV node is pacing the heart. And so that would explain a slower heart rate, and that would be a problem that you would need medical attention for. Sinus bradycardia is not necessarily bad. It could also be that they're on digoxin or some other medication that lowers their heart rate. Uh, so not necessarily an emergency. Sinus tachycardia can also be normal, especially in response to exercise. Um, everything looks normal and regular. P waves are present. RR intervals are are consistent. The rate is just very high. So let's do this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 times 10, 110. So it's over 100. So this person is tachycardic. This is sinus tachycardia. Sinus arrhythmia. This, if you see the word sinus, that means P waves are normal and the SA node is the pacemaker. It's functional. But in this case, we have irregular RR intervals. So everything's the same as NSR, but the RR intervals are irregular. That is most often caused by inconsistent vagal stimulation. And any number of things can cause that, um, but it's uh, 
could, it could be abnormal. This person should probably seek some kind of medical attention, or it could be normal. Uh, there's a lot of different things that could cause inconsistent vagal stimulation. So the parasympathetic nervous system is inconsist- inconsistent in slowing the heart rate. So you get rate variation. That's an arrhythmia. Now we're going to talk about a few different atrial arrhythmias. Uh, so the first one is called the wandering atrial pacemaker. And this means that the P waves are ver- they vary in configuration. So this P wave looks different than that P wave, looks different than that P wave, looks different than that P wave. Uh, so this, this, if there's no symptoms, isn't necessarily a huge cause for concern, but it does indicate that something is going on with the SA node. Um, and, and also the RR intervals tend to vary uh, because different parts of the atria are pacing the heart, not necessarily a well-functioning SA node. Uh, so, so this would be abnormal. PACs, premature atrial complexes, they're abnormal but also are not necessarily an emergency. Uh, I mean, these can be caused by caffeine, for example. So it's something other than the SA node briefly paces the heart. So you have a depolarization event in either atria that initiates an impulse before the next SA no- before the next impulse can be initiated by the SA node. So the SA node is fine. There's nothing wrong with the SA node. There's an ectopic focus. There's another part of the atria that's firing when it shouldn't. So if we look here, normal P wave, QRS. Normal P wave, QRS. Normal P wave, QRS. Normal P wave, QRS. Abnormal P wave. The SA node didn't do that. Something else did that. And so you can see a few different PACs on this on this chart here. Um, that can lead to some irregularity in our R in our R interval. Uh, but generally speaking, if there aren't too many of them, um, this isn't a huge cause for concern. But the more of these we see, the more concerned we become. If we start to see three or more of them in a row, that is that becomes a, a big concern. And this could be a medical emergency potentially. Um, and so in this case, we see all of, all of them pretty much are abnormal. So this one, this one, this one. So we have multiple PACs in a row. That's going to lead to the heart rate being elevated, 100 to 200. Um, and the PR intervals will vary. But generally speaking, it will be less than 0.2. Let me talk about PR interval. If you don't remember from cardiac physiology, PR interval indicates the health of the AV node. So the P wave tells us about the SA node or some other ectopic um, region of depolarization in the atria. The PR interval tells us about the AV node. So atrial tachycardia isn't necessarily an AV node issue, so it should be pretty uh, consistent below 0.2. If it's longer than 0.2, we start worrying about AV node health. So atrial tachycardia is common with COPD. Uh, The underlying cause needs to be addressed. You know, due to an inability to breathe effectively, pH is dropping, your blood's becoming acidic and hypoxemic. So that needs to be addressed. Um, Also, atrial tachycardia can sometimes be addressed through autonomic maneuvers like Valsalva, coughing, and breath holding. It sort of resets the rhythm. I actually knew someone I really, like my uncle, I believe by marriage. I just remember him telling me when he was a kid, he, all of a sudden his heart rate would be like 200 while playing soccer. He was in great shape. So it wasn't a, it was, had nothing to do with his health necessarily. Um, and so he, he remembers it got up to 200. He'd, there's been times in the past where he'd have to be defibrillated. Even it was that bad. But the one thing that would tend to stop it would be the Valsalva maneuver, bearing down, holding your breath and squeezing. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of interesting. <clears throat> All right. So our next one is paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. Paroxysmal just sort of means inconsistent. Uh, so it's not constant. Remember atrial tachycardia was three in a row. Um, but, you know, it, it, it could persist uh, for, for some duration of time and, and worsen. Paroxysmal just sort of comes out of the blue. It's an episodic burst of tachycardia. So all of a sudden here, boom, 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 normal. 
And again, coughing, breath holding, Valsalva um, can address this. Atrial flutter. This is uh, this is not this is not good. This is multiple P wave depolarizations in between QRS complexes. So tachycardia was you know it's still one P wave to one QRS complex, one P wave, one QRS complex. This is multiple P waves, and it sort of has a sawtooth pattern. And the atria are depolarizing 250 to 350 times per minute. That doesn't mean you're your pulse is 350 per minute. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the pulse is 70, but look how many P waves there are. There's about three to one. So it's like more like 210 or more P waves, but only 70 QRS complexes per minute. So that's a that's a big issue. This is treated with digoxin, beta blockers, or sometimes uh, cardio version with paddles at 10 to 50 watts. If the heart rate gets over 100, it becomes a, a real medical problem that needs to be addressed immediately. Uh, but as long as long as heart rate is is somewhat low, this uh, I mean you still need to seek treatment, but it's not as emergent. Atrial fibrillation is um, a uh, a problem that needs to be addressed. It, 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 you, your, your likelihood of stroke and heart attack goes up significantly with atrial fibrillation. And it's an erratic quivering of the atrial muscle caused by multiple ectopic foci in the atria. So the SA node is no longer pacing the heart. There are no regular P waves. And um, the RR interval is irregularly irregular. I'll come back to that. How often the ventricle contract is based on the AV node? Uh, it could be bradycardic because the AV node depolarizes less frequently than the SA node, but it's going to be irregular um, for sure because the AV node is just being overwhelmed by ectopic foci. It doesn't know what's going on. And so here is atrial flutter, which we've already seen, has a sawtooth pattern. Atrial fibrillation is just this very, like, irregular P wave area. Um, what does irregularly irregular mean? Well, you can have a regular, irregular heart rate. Sounds r ridiculous. But what that means is you might have a beat every 10 seconds that uh, the RR interval is extended or shortened. So it's not normal, but it is regular. It's predictable. Irregularly irregular means it's irregular and it's unpredictably irregular. It's all over the place. The RR intervals are constantly changing. That's typical of atrial fibrillation. Um, so the pulse is going to vary based on the AV node. Typically it's, you know, relatively benign, meaning um, it's not immediately life-threatening. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far to call it benign, but as long as it's, your heart rate's below 100 beats per minute. Now we'll talk about some nodal or junctional arrhythmias. So, um, a junctional arrhythmia or a nodal arrhythmia, it's it's in the AV node or right after the AV node. So in the AV node, it would be called nodal. Right after the AV, AV node is junctional. And all of these can really be either. You can have a premature nodal complex or a premature junctional complex. So what we see is a, a premature AV impulse that's inverted, absent, or retrograde. Uh, what does... What does that mean? Well, let this is a normal sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm, normal, normal, normal. What is this? There's no P wave. There's an absent P wave. That's a junctional complex. It could also be inverted. It could be upside down or it could be retrograde. Retrograde means it happens on the other side of the QRS complex. You have a QRS complex followed by a P wave. That would be very unusual. Um, anyway, so you can see there's typically a pause after the premature complex. This is called a compensa compensatory pause. We had two beats close together, so now the heart compensates and takes a little rest. The QRS configurations are identical except for, you know, the one that has the missing P wave. The PR, or sorry, the RR intervals are also regular. The distance between these is uniform. 
except for the premature junctional beat. This is irregular. This distance is different from this distance. So everything's pretty normal except for the junctional beat. Heart rate is typically normal, and this is typically benign. Oh, I forgot to put a photo here. Darn it. Um, so a junctional rhythm occurs when the AV node takes over pacing. Uh, the P waves are absent. So there, this, this is a this is a rhythm with no P waves. An occasional retrograde P wave. Everything else is normal. Normal QRS, normal RR interval, typically a slow heart rate. You just don't see any P waves. Um, so a junctional rhythm is is something that needs to be investigated absolutely by by your you know the patient's cardiologist uh nodal tachycardia looks looks the same there's no p wave so here you can see an example no p wave qrst 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 but it's tachycardic and this can be due to hyperventilation caffeine myocarditis stress other agitating factors and the treatment for this is typically digoxin or vagal stimulation. And that slows heart rate down, and the P wave could recover if the SA node is healthy. That brings us to heart blocks. I found this. I love this. I could have used this in PT school. The heart block poem. If the R is far from P, then you have a first degree heart block. So see the P wave is 0.28 seconds from the R wave, Anything greater than 0.2 is abnormal. So if R is far from P, then you have a first degree. Longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a Wenkebach. A Wenkebach. Wink I like to call this a Mobitz type 1. You can use either. It's a type of second degree heart block. There's two types of second degree heart block, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is often called Wenkebach. Um, but longer, longer, longer drop. So here we go, P wave, PR interval, normal, 0.18. P wave, PR interval, looks longer. P wave, really long PR interval, 0.25 seconds. P wave, no QRS complex. Okay, so longer, longer, longer drop. Then you have a Wenkebach. Uh, if some P waves don't get through, then you have a Mobitz 2. So P wave, QRS. T wave, P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, dropped beat, P wave. That's a Mobitz type two. There's no progressive lengthening in PR interval. So that's how you differentiate these two. Both result in dropped beats. One just has a progressive lengthening of the PR, one doesn't. If P's and Q's don't agree, then you have a third degree. Third degree is an emergency, it's immediately life threatening. Um, basically the atria and ventricle are functioning independently. The AV node is not, uh, it's not regulating that they're, they're unlinked. They're decoupled electrically. And so the P waves and the R waves don't add up. The ratio varies. It's not uniform. The rates differ. Okay. So let's go through them again really quick. First degree heart block has a normal P wave. It's, it's a sinus rhythm technically. The SA node initiates, but the signal is delayed on the way to the AV node. Uh, so the PR interval is lengthened only. No other symptom other than a longer than usual PR interval that's greater than 0.2 seconds. So if you count this, I'm trying to find one where it's right on a box. Like this one. Okay, this is good. It starts, the P wave starts before the dark line and the QRS happens after the dark line. So that box is 0.2 seconds. So this is greater than 0.2 seconds. So this is a first degree heart block. This is a second degree type one or a Wenkebach. So remember, longer, longer, longer drop. So short PR, long PR, holy moly. Super long PR because there's no QRS. So there is no PR, it's just P wave, P wave, dropped beat. So. In this case, it's longer drop. Well, you, we really only have two. So we have this one, then we have this one, then we have a dropped beat. So the PR interval got longer, and then we had a dropped beat. So this is longer, longer, longer drop. A Mobitz type two is when there's more P waves and QRS complexes, 
and the PR intervals can vary, but they're not progressively lengthening before the dropped beat. So P, QRS, T, P, dropped beat, P, QRS, T, P, dropped beat. So it's, you know, a little bit more, uh, it's, it's, there's not a progressive lengthening of the PR interval. That's a Mobitz type two. So there's going to be a lot more P waves in QRS complexes. So that's what we mean by P wave to QRS ratio is greater than one. Third degree heart block is no electrical relationship between the atria and ventricles. The P waves are normal because the SA node is normal. Uh, the RR interval is regular because it's, it's being paced by something else in the ventricles. So the P waves and the QRSs are regular. They're just not connected. Remember, the P wave should initiate the QRS complex. They're just doing their own thing. Look, the P waves are, are normal and regular. P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, right? The R's are regular. R, 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 they're equidistant. But the two have no relationship with one another. So this requires a placement of a permanent pacemaker, and it's a medical emergency. All right. Uh, we have some ventricle arrhythmias, PVCs, tachycardia, and fibrillation, just like the atrial arrhythmias. Remember, we had PACs, atrial tachycardia, and atrial fib. These are now, we're talking about the ventricles, and these are typically much more serious than atrial arrhythmias. A PVC is, like a PAC, an ectopic depolarization. So some other portion of the heart depolarizes and causes the ventricles to contract. So here we go, normal, well actually this isn't technically normal, but normal QRS, T, P, QRS, T, no P wave, just a big QRS, really weird looking, and then it starts over. So it's just a, kind of a random extra beat, and it's followed by a compensatory pause. So we had two beats close together, so there's a elongation here. Uh, the severity varies, but if you're seeing PVCs, it should be assessed. Just like atrial tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia is three or more PVCs in a row. In this case, it's, you know, pretty much this whole six-second strip is, is PVCs. So you're seeing these really irregular kind of sawtooth ventricular depolarizations. This requires immediate medical care if you see something like this on an ECG. It's an emergency. Then you have ventricular fibrillation. It's just quivering, grossly irregular QRS complexes. Um, this is, this is uh, as serious of a medical condition that can exist. This requires immediate defibrillation um, and injection of medication. This is like when you see a crash cart in a hospital coming to your room. This is what's going on. Okay, so that brings us to ischemia, infarction, and injury. These, these are all different sides of the same coin. Ischemia is when your heart needs more oxygen than it's getting. Infarction is the consequence of sustained ischemia. It's actual damage. And it's a type of injury. You know, there's multiple types of heart injuries that can occur. Infarction is one of them. So this is a normal QRS or P, QRS, and T wave. This is a normal ECG tracing for one cardiac cycle. Anytime we see ST elevation or depression, we're thinking abnormal. Something is abnormal. The ST segment and the T wave tell us a lot about oxygen, the presence of oxygen in the heart. So if we see T wave inversion, where the T wave is upside down, or ST segment, remember this is ST segment right here, the gap between S and T. If we see inversion or depression, infarction is occurring. Absolutely. Uh, it's most likely subendocardial. If we see elevation, that is certainly an injury. It can be different types of injury. One of them could be a transmural infarction, which is very bad. Uh, but bad injury has occurred in the heart when you see ST segment elevation. Both are emergencies unless it's normal for the patient because they had a heart attack and there is permanent damage. And then this is just now the consequence um, so, so it depends on the situation. Uh, I just, I do want to say a lot of times this can be reversible if the heart attack is mild, if it's caught quickly, um, or it, it may not be reversible. 
So that is our very quick overview of ECG. That actually was about how long I wanted it to take. I was worried that would take longer. And the reason I wanted to just go through it quickly is we're going to do this all in lab. But I didn't want you to come in completely blind to lab, so we'll go into more detail about this in person. Um, but now you guys have a quick quick overview, and you can move on to the examination presentation after this with some knowledge about pharmacology and ECG. And uh, that will be it for this week, those three lectures. So, so three lectures will be posted. Uh, they should already be if you're watching this. And I'm not sure how many quizzes we'll have yet, but you'll see when you log into the module what the plan is. Uh, also, remember to turn in your outlines for your presentations by our lab on Thursday. Um, and that's it. Talk soon. Thanks, everybody.